It's Wednesday, the 26th of August. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And so far this fire season, we've lost three helicopters, two single engine air tankers, and one crew member from the CL215 water bomber in Portugal. We're gonna be discussing these events. We've got an NTSB preliminary report to discuss on the single engine air tanker mid-air collision. And we also have a NTSB preliminary report to discuss about the mid-air collision in Soldatna, Alaska. On Monday the 24th of August we lost our third helicopter in this year's fire season. Tom Duffy, age 40, son of Mark Duffy, owner of Central Helicopters based out of Belgrade, Montana. Tom lost his life in a long line accident with a K-Max 1200 helicopter while fighting the White Rim fire out of Oregon. That's uh, about a 1300 acre fire just 11 miles southeast of Mount Hood. The K-Max helicopter November 314 that's a large type 1 helicopter. The K-Max is that unique helicopter with the two count the two rotating helicopter blades. This appears to be a long line incident and we have no more information on this accident at this time. This was preceded by the tragic loss of Michael John Forner, age 52, while also fighting a fire. This is one in Coalinga, California. This is the Hills Fire. He was performing water drops. Not sure if this was a long, another long line operation or a short line operation, but nevertheless a Bambi bucket operation. Remember the Bambi bucket is that collapsible bucket that helicopters use below their machines. They dip down into the, a source of water, pick it up and drop it onto hot spots on the fire. This was a UH-1H helicopter, I believe a single engine helicopter, owned and operated by Guardian Helicopters out of Fillmore, California. Again, no news as to what the cause of that accident was. And back on July 7th, we had our first helicopter accident for this fire season when 37-year-old Brian Jeffrey Boatman lost his life flying another UH-1B November 623 Papa Bravo on the Poles fire in the Tonto National Forest in Arizona. He was also doing a long line operation resupplying supplies to the firefighters out in the field. He was coming in to drop the supplies when the accident occurred. No more information on that accident at this time. These uh, young men all These pilots all had young families and were well respected in their community and deserve to be remembered. The only commonality between these three accidents is this was some form of line work, either long, long line work or short line work, better known as vertical reference work in the helicopter industry. Vertical reference work requires a lot of experience and is a very difficult thing to learn to do you have to basically fly the helicopter like this all day long you got to be flying the aircraft with reference to your load on these single pilot contract operations the pilot is watching the load below him and flying the helicopter in reference to that load below him at all times it's a it's a job that requires a lot of skill and a lot of experience so in accident investigators We'll be looking at the skill level of each of these operators. In the case of Michael John Forner on the Hills Fire in Colinga, it sounds like this was his first season of firefighting. 
And these sort of operations are also extremely vulnerable to any sort of mechanical malfunction. The, the, the nature, the utility nature of that operation makes it extremely hazardous if in the event there is any sort of power loss from the helicopter itself while performing these operations this close to the ground. NTSB will be investigating. We'll have more on these accidents soon. That brings us to the NTSB preliminary report on the loss of the two seats, the mid-air collision. Let's get to the report. This accident occurred on July 30th, about 12.56 Pacific Daylight Time, two Air Tractor AT-802 aircraft, November 8510 Mike and November 1558 Whiskey were destroyed. They were involved in an accident near Eglin, Nevada. Both pilots of both airplanes were fatally injured and they were used as public use firefighting flights. The airplanes were functioning as single engine air tankers, that's what we call seats, for the Bureau of Land Management, better known as BLM, providing aerial firefighting services at the time of the accident. According to Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast Data, ADSB, so these aircraft did have some form of collision avoidance technology on board them. ADSB and witness statements, the airplanes departed Mesquite, Nevada as a flight of two at about 12.25 to deploy their third load of the fire retardant that day. So I believe, as we discussed in the previous update on this accident, this was day two of the fire or they were in an extended attack of the fire. In other words, day one is called initial attack. That's the chaotic first day of the fire. After the initial attack day becomes extended attack, that's when firefighters have a plan to attack the fire. That means things are getting more organized. The ADSB data showed that 10 Mike was in the lead and 58 Whiskey was in trail as they flew northeast towards a designated fire traffic area and a climb. At uh, 1252, the pilot of 10 Mike, that's the lead aircraft, started a descent from 7,100 feet, accompanied by a slight right turn to the north, and then he turned west for about 15 seconds later. 58 Whiskey, that's number two, followed the movements of 10 Mike from about 1,500 feet behind him. About this time, a lead airplane, so they did have a lead aircraft on the fire. They had some additional supervision. They were not doing this. The seats were not doing this as initial attack aircraft. They were working with the lead aircraft, which corresponds to the extended attack nature of this, of this day of firefighting. About this time, a lead airplane had begun to escort the flight of the two seats to their intended drop area. At uh, 54 after the hour, five, the lead aircraft turned left to a southwest heading and descended from about 6,000 feet, while two still trailed about 1,500 feet behind them. Number two aircraft, began a turn to the southeast a few seconds later and descended from 6,100 feet, but, when, but then leveled out. Number two was about 500 feet in trail and 100 feet below the lead aircraft. So 1,500 feet sounds about right for their normal... Let me back up a little bit. This, this is not so much an operational issue as I was concerned about on the first, my first report on this accident. This is boiling down to a formation accident, a formation flying accident. 1,500 feet sounds to me to be about the right trail distance for these two aircraft, but somehow during this maneuvering, that <clears throat> 1,500 feet closed into just 500 feet and put number two aircraft below lead. There's no need, there's no tactical reason to get this close to each other while doing aerial firefighting. Sing seats and smaller air tankers will do daisy chain attacks on fires where they'll drop one load followed by a second airplane and another load and tag on and extend that line in pretty close succession to each other. But this is way too close because here's what happens. So the number two aircraft was 500 feet in trail and 100 feet below the lead aircraft. The data show that the airplane were in a descent about 400 feet above the ground the ADSB data ceased temporarily. Then when it resumed, it showed 
the lead aircraft in a climb along a southeast heading. The track for number two aircraft resumed and showed that airplane in a climb on a similar heading about 70 feet in trail and 125 feet below the lead aircraft. Video recorded by a ground witness captured both airplanes seconds before their collision, which showed the lead aircraft descend to a low altitude, deploy fire retardant, and then immediately began a shallow climb, which is your standard drop. The video showed the number two aircraft following very close in trail to the lead aircraft during this time, when the number two aircraft deployed fire retardant and then began a rapid climb. Witnesses in nearby firefighting aircraft stated that they heard that the pilot of 5-8 Whiskey, the number two aircraft, announced over the radio that he had retardant on his windshield and was initiating a go-around. According to witnesses on the ground, 5-8 Whiskey, the number two aircraft, climbed. It suddenly began a left turn and collided with the lead aircraft. Both the aircraft then descended rapidly into the ground. So. We got a 1,500 foot trail formation working its way into the fire and while they're maneuvering down into the fire, somehow the number two aircraft gets closes within 500 feet distance and 100 feet below the lead aircraft. Not a good position to be in. The lead aircraft starts his drop probably unaware of just how close number two is behind him. That sprays the windshield of number two aircraft, and while the lead aircraft makes his standard climb out of the fire, the number two aircraft, blinded by retardant, even though they usually have a windshield wiper, but I don't think, it's not like a car, they don't have a fluid that they can squirt on there. It's just going to be a muddy mess, even if he hits the wiper. Blinded by retardant, the number two aircraft says he's going around, starts a sharp pitch up, climb up, and slams right into the lead aircraft. In military formation procedures, we would consider this something along the lines of a lost um, wingman formation procedure, but in aerial firefighting, I, I, I doubt this is discussed very often. The, the bottom line is, is the number two aircraft just simply got too close to the lead aircraft and put himself, put both of them in the end in a very fatal position. So it does sound like both aircraft did have some sort of um, anti-collision technology on board the aircraft. This is a formation accident. That sort of anti-collision technology may or may not help. This is just going to develop in a matter of seconds. This is a matter of just getting too close to each other. If you had had that technology on board and were able to to keep your situational awareness as to where lead was once you lost sight of everything because of a retardant covering your windshield that may have helped you make what your decision would be to get out of that for your escape maneuver or your lost wingman procedure as we call it in the military as to how to get out of that predicament in the military this lost wingman thing was more of a some something we briefed and used on instrument procedures lost wingman procedures were for flying on instruments in formation. Uh, you're the number two aircraft, you're flying uh, right on the wingtip of the lead aircraft and then the lead aircraft is leading you on an instrument approach through the weather. So as you as the number two aircraft, you cannot look at your instruments at all. You are completely flying formation off of the lead aircraft and relying on him to keep you upright in the weather. As the number two aircraft, it's very disorienting because you're not looking at your instruments and you can't see the ground because you're in the weather. If in the event you get to maneuvering or you lose your position, if you get just a little bit out of position in the weather, you lose sight of lead. You got to have a procedure to get you safely away from the lead aircraft. And we had various procedures depending on what portion of the instrument approach you were on to create separation and maintain separation from each other if you were to lose sight of each other on one of these instrument approaches. This is not something that's used in aerial firefighting. Now let's look at the NTSB preliminary accident report regarding the mid-air collision in Soldotna, Alaska. This is the accident involving the Alaska representative in his PA-12 aircraft and the 
de Havilland Beaver on a Part 135 charter flight near Soldotna. On July 31st, 2020, about 8.27 in the morning, Alaska Daylight Time, de Havilland DHC-2 Beaver airplane, November 4982 uniform, and a Piper PA-12 airplane, November 2587 Mike, were destroyed when they were involved in an accident near Soldotna, Alaska. Both pilots and five passengers on the DHC-2 were fatally injured. The DHC-2 was operating as a Title 14 Part 135 on-demand charter flight, so he was operating under Part 135. He was not, he was not able to take advantage of the Part 91 loophole because of the nature of the flight. The PA-12 was operated as a Title 14 Part 91 personal flight. The float-equipped DHC-2 operated by High Adventure Charter departed Longmere Lake, Soldotna, about 0824 bound for a remote lake on the west side of the Cook Inlet. The purpose of the flight was to transport the passengers to a remote fish fishing location. The PA-12 operated by a private individual departed Soldotna, this is the Alaska representative, Gary Knopp, Departed Soldotna Airport, Soldotna, Alaska, about 8:24, bound for Fairbanks, Alaska. Preliminary flight track data revealed that the DHC-2 was traveling northwest, about 1,175 feet mean sea level, and gradually climbing about 78 knots when it crossed the Sterling Highway. The PA-12 was traveling northeast at the same altitude, about 71 knots north and parallel to the Sterling Highway. The airplanes collided about two and a half miles northeast of the Soldotna Airport at, an al at that same altitude, 1,175 feet, and the data signals were lost. It looks like the PA-12 impacted the Beaver on the right rear of the fuselage. A witness located near the accident site observed the DHC-2 traveling in a westerly direction and the PA-12 heading in a northerly direction. He stated that the PA-12 impacted the DHC-2 on the left side of the fuselage toward the back of the airplane. After the collision, he observed the DHC-2 left, left wing separate. Dark green paint transfers consistent with the PA-12 were observed on the aft fuselage of the DHC-2 Beaver. And here's where things get a little unusual with this accident. The DHC-2 was registered to Soldotna Aircraft Equipment Leasing and Registration Card. A registration card located inside the PA-12 identified the airplane as a PA-12 with a registration number of November 2587 Mike. The Federal Aviation Administration registration database revealed that November 2587 Mike was a valid registration for a PA-12 assigned to that pilot. Gary Knopp. However, the PA-12's exterior registration number, the number, the end number painted on the side of the aircraft, identified the airplane as November 1904 Tango. In addition, the word experimental was applied to the inside of the lower clamshell door. A search of the FAA registration database revealed that the registration number had been reserved by the pilot but was not a valid registration. So was Gary in the process of converting a certified aircraft, the PA-12, originally registered as a certified production aircraft, was Gary in the process of changing the registration of his aircraft or the certification of his aircraft from a certified aircraft to an experimental aircraft? Was he going through the proper procedures to do this? The local FISDO office will have this information or did he simply just change the end numbers and change it over to experimental? One of the advantages of, well, the FAA kind of takes a dim view or it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a process to take a certified aircraft and convert it to an experimental aircraft. The advantage of doing something like that is with an experimental aircraft, you can, you can modify the aircraft easier. As a certified aircraft, any modification to the aircraft has to be via a supplemental type certificate, paperwork, and money. A lot of these, uh, well, a PA-12 Bush type aircraft, they, they like to be modified to it improve their um, handling characteristics out in the bush. Bigger wheels, bigger, taller landing gear, stronger struts. All of this requires STCs or has to be listed on the original certificate of the aircraft as approved equipment. As experimental, it's much easier to make these changes. 
Now here's here's a potentially a big deal. According to information on file with the FAA Civil Aeronautics Institute, the pilot of the PA-12, it's Gary Knopp, was denied a medical certification. I know a thing or two about that. He was denied a medical certification on June of 2012 by the Alaska Regional Flight Surgeon due to vision problems. The denial was appealed and sustained on July of 2012. So it sounds like Gary was flying around ever since 2012 without a, a medical. When you have a license, of, a pilot's license from the FAA, that license is only valid with a current medical certificate. The, the FAA issues the license aeromedical examiners designated by the FAA issue the medical. You need both pieces of paper together to be current and qualified to go flying as a pilot in command. The FAA does not track a pilot's medical. It's incumbent on the pilot to have the medical with him and his license anytime he's flying to produce this paperwork if requested by a, an FAA person on the ground at any time. In the airline industry, this documentation is tracked very closely. It's tracked by computer. You put the input into the computer giving the date and the doctor that your medical um, came from, and that expiration date of your medical is tracked very closely. And anytime you come in for a simulator event, uh, any sort of training event, the first thing you got to do is bring out your license and your medical, and the examiner has to verify that your medical that you are in fact current and qualified and you have the correct paperwork for your training. I'm sure it's the same way in the civilian world anytime you go for an additional rating. But in this case Gary was able to renew his flight instructor's rating without having to produce evidence of a current medical. What's disturbing is that he was grounded for vision problems. This whole accident is a sea and avoid, was in a sea and avoid flying type operation. That means you gotta be able to see. Neither airplane was equipped with, nor were they required to be equipped with a crash worthy flight data recorder or cockpit voice recorder. Several avionics components and personal electronic devices were recovered from the wreckage areas and they're being investigated. It, and, and further inv investigation is still pending. Again, this is an accident that, in my opinion, had the Part 135 operator, well, if <laughs> it, a TCAS or ADSB would only be of benefit to the Part 135 operator if the other aircraft had the similar equipment on board his aircraft. If you don't have ADSB or a transponder on the offending aircraft, all the technology in the world is not going to help you. So that's the update for today. Very rough start to a very long fire season here in the western United States. This is just incredibly dangerous work. Just be careful. It's not an emergency. These fires happen every year. Yeah, they get a little bit bigger each year, but there's, there's only so much you can do about them. The best thing is just get out of the way. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, and thank you so much, you patrons, that make this content possible here on YouTube. See you here.